It is International Women's Day here at the Real News Network. It's marking the 90th anniversary of the first National Women's Day in the U.S. that took place in New York City in 1909. International Women's Day is really a rally for the peace movement, women's rights, better working conditions, all coming together under the banner of socialism. Perhaps that is why this day is not marked in any significant way here in the U.S., but in Canada, Russia, Turkey, many other Latin American countries, it's a national holiday. It is marked as a very important day for women's liberation. Well, it is quite appropriate then. We are joined today by two phenomenal women who are the torchbearers of that history, of that movement. And coming to us from Washington, D.C., we are joined by Medea Benjamin, co-founder of Code Pink and the author of Inside Iran, the real history and politics of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And here in our Baltimore studio, we have Dr. Margaret Flowers. Flowers is a pediatrician in Baltimore and co-chair of the Maryland Chapter of Physicians for National Health Program and a co-director of popularresistance.org and is uh, also a founder of It's Our Economy. And Kevin Zies, also co-founder of Popular Resistance and a member of the advisory board of World Beyond War. And Kevin's here because he is a, a you know, ardent supporter of the two women <laughs> that oh, are course. also here. Two of my favorite women, plus you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm so lucky. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. All right, Maria, let me start with you. Um, this program is really about a peace delegation you recently took, organized by Code Pink, to Iran. And uh, let's start off with what your mission was in taking a delegation of Americans to Iran and uh, whether you met your objectives. One of the reasons we wanted to go to Iran was to see how the Trump administration's unilateral withdrawal from the Iran nuclear agreement and subsequent imposition of very harsh sanctions was affecting the lives of the Iranian people. And certainly, as we traveled around the country talking to people, we found several things. One is that the purchasing power of people has plummeted, uh, making it very difficult for them to feed their families, to uh, decide on important life choices, like putting off getting married because they didn't have the money anymore, traveling overseas, even going to a university overseas was no longer possible for many of them. And then even though the sanctions are supposed to exclude medicines, we did find that although Iran produces most of its own medicines, certain uh, medicines for uh, diseases like cancer, multiple scler sclerosis, or diabetes, uh, it was b difficult for them to find those. So we found from life choices to life-saving medicines, the sanctions have made people's uh, lives quite difficult. All right, Margaret, uh, your observations and what you found. Well, I went there to see for myself, to see Iran. We don't get a lot of information about it here in the United States and to make connections with the people of Iran. And we had great success at that. I think one of the things that I found that you know is unfortunate. We went to the University of Tehran, where we met with world studies students, some who were doing American studies, and because of the travel ban in the United States, they can't come to the United States to see it firsthand. There's also very limited exchange. It's um, difficult for them to get books translated from the United States because even when the authors agree to have the book translated, then they can't make the financial transaction with the publisher to complete that contract. So, uh, speaking, you know, spending time with the students. Students and you know just seeing Iran and it's a country with such a deep history and such a mature society it just struck me what a, a real loss it is to people in the United States to not be able to have a cultural and academic exchange with the people of Iran such a, a huge and long history uh, in Iran that people could benefit from absolutely um, for our that. adolescent country <laughs> yeah all right, uh, Kevin, let's get you in on this. In terms of uh, what 
came out of this uh, peace delegation mission and uh, what you achieved? Well, I think we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, I think we made some great first steps, built some excellent contacts, and I was very impressed with how much the Iranian people love the American people. I was told that so many times, whether I was in a, in a bazaar at a shop or at the University of Tehran with students or academics or with government officials, uh, it was all so positive. They really want to have a good relationship with the United States, and they're disappointed that they don't. And so I think there's room for us to really work toward achieving a positive relationship. And I do think it is like the United, the, uh, Tehran, uh, Iran is 2,500 years old. I mean, it's 2,000 years old. It's, we're, it's 10 times as old as we are. We're an adolescent bully uh, to this really mature country. With, in addition to being a country for 2,000 years, 7,000 years of civilized history and a very complicated government. We went to the parliament. And just like our parliament fights about the budget, they were 11 days from the budget deadline. And they were shouting at each other in the parliament about various aspects of the budget. Real, you felt like a real democracy there, real debate. And I'm sure like our democracy, it's flawed. Theirs is flawed too. Limited uh, debate is allowed in our country as well as theirs. But there is debate. And, it's, and there's lots of checks and balances. I think there's a lot we don't understand about Iran and a lot we can learn. Uh, and we, if we had a more positive relationship, we could probably help each other a lot. And uh, to your point about being welcomed and very happy to hear and see Americans, um, I think that desire is really squashed here when there's travel warnings to Iran and you hear so much negative stories about how people are imprisoned and, uh, and uh, detained by the government and so on, which was not your experience, right, Margaret? I felt safe the entire time that I was there. And in fact, people went out of their way to welcome us. So so, yeah, exactly. It's the complete opposite of what we hear. Okay. And to that point, uh, Medea, when you returned from Iran, uh, you got quite the welcome in uh, Washington, D.C. Yes. Not only did uh, Anne Wright and I get called to secondary screening, but after that, we were greeted by FBI agents who had a whole dossier on us of what we did, which mostly they got from our own website, our blogs. <laughs> but they also had a packet of information for us about the sanctions on Iran, the um, U.S. government policies towards Iran, uh, the issue about uh, registering as a foreign agent, uh, indictment of Iranian groups uh, to scare us away from talking to them. And uh, yes, it was not the warm welcome that we received when we went to Iran. <laughs> now, I know you, uh, all of you went on uh, some incredible exchanges. Uh, you went to the Peace Museum, but definitely one of the highlights of your trip was meeting with the foreign minister himself, Javad uh, Zarif. And uh, it was an interesting time to be in Iran because he had actually resigned his post as foreign minister. And then after he spoke to us, right after that with us. <laughs> <laughs> He spoke to us, he was still foreign minister for nine <laughs> After he spoke to us, he resigned. <laughs> and then the next day he was reinstated. Uh, so uh, let me go to you, Margaret. What exactly happened? And uh, then I'll call on uh, Medea right. to talk about the meeting. And Kevin it was well. amazing. This was our first morning in Iran, and we were brought to the foreign ministry to meet with the foreign minister, uh, Zarif, and brought into a big room, as usual, tea and you know, sweets, that was everywhere we went. And uh, he initially asked him what questions we had. He took a few questions and then he gave about an hour long uh, speech that was just tremendous. He went on and on about how we can't have security in the world when some areas are insecure about our connectedness, connectedness and globalization and how we really need to work together. He went through uh, the, the more than 10 years really of negotiating the Iran nuclear agreement and how painstaking that was and how happy people in Iran were when that was passed and how disappointing it was that the United States didn't keep our end of that, of that bargain. And then he took some more questions um, afterwards. So it was uh, just more time than we could have expected. It was a great experience. All right, Medea, let me go to you. Um, this was a major achievement. I mean, you don't often get a civilian delegation uh, going to Iran and get opportunity to actually meet with the foreign minister. How did you actually achieve that? So I have the same question <laughs> that the FBI agents had for you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I had actually met the foreign minister in the in New York at the United Nations and told him that we were organizing this delegation and asked then if we would be able to meet. Uh, but we, of course, didn't know until we got there whether that would happen. And I want to echo what Margaret said, because he's such an intelligent man, and he staked his reputation on negotiating with uh, John Kerry and the West. And now with Trump coming in and just ripping up that deal, both he and the President Rouhani are really under intense pressure now because the deal is barely hanging on by a thread and the economic relief that the Iranian people thought they would get from this deal has not happened. So part of the reason that he resigned is because he was uh, challenged so much by those on the right who said, you should never have talked to the United States. You should never negotiate with the West. They are untrustworthy. And indeed, uh, those conservatives were right. Uh, we are not trustworthy. And that's why it's so important that we do everything we can as U.S. citizens to try to get the U.S. back into the nuclear agreement and move forward on a path of dialogue uh, because having somebody like Zarif to talk to is um, is very rare and very important. And if he uh, loses power and all of those who are part of this uh, movement to uh, increase their uh, their uh, connections with the West lose power, uh, we are definitely going to be on the path of war, which is the path that the Trump administration is taking us down. All right, Kevin, uh, your um, observations of that meeting and the foreign minister and the dialogue you had, what came out of it? It was you? amazing. I mean, he is so well aware of Iranian politics and U.S. politics. He was educated from high school to, to, through his Ph.D. in the United States, so he knows U.S. politics. He became involved in the foreign ministry at a very early age because the revolution happens in 1979. They need someone to be involved in the foreign ministry, and he's a young Ph.D. graduate, and he gets to be working at the U.N. And so he's been at the top echelons of Iranian government for forever. Uh, so he knows that politics. And what really impressed me was how aware he was of public opinion. I never hear Mike Pompeo talk that way. He was aware that 80% were so, so supportive of the uh, nuclear agreement. Now it's down to 51%. He's aware of how it's going to impact the next election and how it may bring a conservative government in and that may undermine relations with the U.S. He, he, he had a plan from the beginning when he started negotiating this in 2005 he thought it was an easy one for them because they don't have nuclear weapons. They weren't planning on building nuclear weapons. So, hey, we're happy to agree not to build nuclear weapons. And agree to that and then build on it. Make a positive step and then another positive step and another positive step to build a positive relationship with the United States. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened. Uh, and so I was just impressed with his intelligence, uh, his ability to understand how U.S. and Iranian politics mix together, and his own politics. I mean, I think he resigned because... Uh, what he said when he resigned was he, he failed the Iranian people, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, and, but what he, what he was, he was losing power. Because of the Trump administration's move, uh, people like him who tried to negotiate the United States were looked at as failures. But when he did that, people also said, you're important to us. Half the Iranian parliament gave a letter to Rouhani saying, keep him, don't accept a resignation. There were uh, words coming out of this, the, uh, the uh, Ayatollah, we, we support him. There was words coming out of the military, we support him. And finally, Rouhani didn't take the resignation. So I think he ended up stronger, uh, but I think he was ready to leave if he wasn't going to be stronger. So I think he's a very smart guy. I hope that he stays, and I hope that the United States actually listens to him, because he's trying to do the best, not only for Iran, but for that region, and for the United States. Our security is weakened if we don't have a good relationship with Iran. It's in our interest to have a positive relationship. All right, Medea, um, the foreign minister identifies the Iranian revolution as the departing point as far as relations with the U.S. is concerned. You wrote the book recently on Iran. Tell us why this departure takes place. Take us back in history. Well, he really talked about the influence of foreigners in Iran's affairs going back hundreds of years. Uh, and he certainly talked about uh, U.S. interference, 1953, overthrowing the democratically elected government, uh, the rupture of relations when the Iranian revolution took place in 1979, and the fact that over these last 40 years, 
Uh, they have not had relations, although Ra Iran has reached out at various points. Um, for example, after the 9-11 attacks in the United States, Iran reached out to the U.S. to uh, show its support. Uh, after the uh, U.S. invaded Afghanistan, Iran helped to get the Northern Alliance uh, at the table to try to come up with a government that would lead to a stable Afghanistan. Uh, I think the foreign minister talked about just a series of um, uh, betrayals by the United States every time Iran wanted to uh, reach out. And though he talked about uh, Saudi Arabia, I don't think he talked very much about uh, uh, Israel. But we know very well that it's both Saudi Arabia and Israel that have really uh, tried to squash the uh, any coming together between the U.S. and Iran, and were especially opposed to the Iran nuclear agreement, and have been trying ever since uh, to get somebody like Trump in power who would uh, rip up that deal. So uh, it is a very sad history of U.S. interference and the U.S. trying to make an Iranian government subservient to, subservient to U.S. interests instead of a sovereign country. Could I add something to that? Because um, when we were at the university speaking with one of the professors, uh, one of the things that he said to us is that, you know, the Shah that was put in place after the coup of uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh was very Western friendly. And uh, the parents of the current students were part of the generation that rose up and overthrew that Shah. And the generation, the current generation is saying, well, they're, they're looking to the West. They're interested in the West. And they look down on their parents for why did you disrupt that relationship? relationship, but after the whole nuclear agreement was torn up, now they're understanding why their parents didn't like the West. And so it's having an, an impact on the current generation of not looking favorably upon us. You know, it's not just the Mossadegh coup. Uh, when we were at the Peace Museum, they showed us the history of the Iraq war and the U.S. role in that. The U.S. encouraged the Iraq invasion, the attempt to take land from Iran. Uh, the U.S. provided Iran with chemical weapons, the precursors of chemical weapons, with intelligence information. Uh, they really were a partner in the Iraq war that killed a million people. And it was a very, that, that affected every family in Iraq. There's so many people Iran. died. In Iran. So many people died. And we later went to the uh, uh, cemetery uh, where thousands of martyrs, they call them, are buried. And uh, the cemetery is packed with people. This is, the war went from 1980 to 1988, and people are still going. One woman went and uh, came up to our group and said that her son, her only son, died in the war, and she has been coming to the cemetery every day since. This is a country that does not want war. Uh, and yet we have people like John Bolton, Mike Pompeo, and Donald Trump talking about war all the time. Uh, it's like uh, two ships passing the night. Uh, Iran wants to find a way to peace. They've made efforts to do that. They negotiated in good faith. They've lived up to the agreement on, on the nuclear agreement. And yet here we have Trump and Pompeo and Bolton threatening war and trying to conduct regime change operations constantly against the country. It's absurd and sad and embarrassing. <laughs> Maria, let me give you the last word here. A lot of this U.S. policy towards uh, Iran has a lot to do with the relationship the United States has with Israel. Um, tell us about that relationship and how it's influencing uh, foreign policy and these uh, threats and sanctions and so on uh, with Iran. Well, Israel and pro-Israel groups put a lot of money into trying to quash the nuclear agreement and didn't succeed. But in response, this was under the Obama administration, he agreed to up the amount of U.S. tax dollars that go to Israel. And of course, this really goes to the Israeli military. Uh, and then in terms of Saudi Arabia, they didn't want the deal either. And the agreement there was that the U.S. was going to help the Saudis in their devastating war on Yemen. And we see the results of that to this day. So I would just end by saying that uh, hopefully uh, there is, uh, with this big controversy around Ilan Omar, uh, a new uh, thinking about uh, Israel and the US relationship and the possibility within the US Congress of even questioning this relationship. And this is an opening for us to talk about Iran 
to push each of the presidential candidates to take a position that the U.S. should rejoin the Iran nuclear agreement. It is already um, uh, in a, uh, the uh, position of the Democratic Party, which is something that the foreign minister Zarif knew about and thought was a very positive thing. So the Iranians are looking to U.S. elections and thinking if they can hold on and we, the American people, are smart enough to uh, vote Trump out of office and put somebody in place uh, who is more rational and really wants to uh, stop a new war in the Middle East with Iran, that this will be a way to bring relief and, and uh, some opening in the relationship. So really, it is our duty to change our government and put somebody in place and a Congress in place as well that will lead us to the path of uh, negotiations, not war. All right, that was Medea Benjamin, co-founder of Code Pink in Washington, D.C. And in our studios, we've had Margaret Flowers and Kevin Zies, co-founders of Popular Resistance. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.